So um, first I'm going to start with a little history um, of my history with IACD, not my history with Symantec, because that's uh, uh, 16 years, and I'll bore you. Um, but I attended my first one um, at the Community Day on, in 2006, 2016, sorry. And uh, then I, oh, I forgot to put the little uh, experience I had there. So Wendy, who's, who's she's not in here, but uh, we had a meeting after, I was really excited after that, that first Community Day, and Wendy invited us to have a, a meeting with a bunch of folks here at Johns, Hop Johns Hopkins, and she asked me, hey, you think Symantec could write some, some proof of concept or something? And I said, sure. Um, uh, accidentally volunteering to write code to do a prototype, and I had no programming experience per se. Um, so I very quickly went online, took some courses on Python and Node programming, and at the, at the March um, IACD Community Day, I presented the Symantec um, OpenC2 to SEP14 prototype. But it was just a, it was a Node.js, you know, cobbled together with uh, duct tape and bubble gum, but it worked. Um, and it showed that OpenC2 could communicate and control SEP14 clients. And then I went a little crazy with now that I had these magical computing, you know, programming powers and wrote a tool um, to help my fellow man to write OpenC2 commands and woman, fellow man, woman, fellow person, and put it online. And then I, I did a panel asking for um, collaboration uh, with competitors and such. Um, and then here we are today, where Symantec has, on April 18th, released the, a product called Symantec Integrated Cyber Defense Exchange that has an OpenC2 actuator, or an actuator that's OpenC2 inspired. As you will see, it's, it's, it's OpenC2, basically. Um, with some minor um, tweaks that would have to be made because uh, when we uh, froze the code, uh, OpenC2 changed a little bit. But our goal is to, as soon as the, the OpenC2 standard is ratified, we're going to match it up. Uh, so as far as we know, we're the first um, commercially available OpenC2 inspired actuator, um, which is kind of cool. Um, and so what I'm going to do today, I'm going to present um, a little bit on the ICDX um, exchange, uh, message bus. Um, not too much, uh, but I'm going to focus more on a live demo actually showing um, OpenC2 commands controlling a device. So I haven't seen any demos today thus far, at least in here. So uh, hopefully the demo gods will, will be gracious. Um, so I did the proof of concept for a gentleman by the name of Brian Berliner at Symantec was a team lead to actually did the production level code. So kudos to him for doing all the hard work. All right, so um, ICDX, I'm going to cover the collectors, forwarders. Um, the, there's, there are two APIs in uh, the product that uh, any programmers in the room will love. Um, they're, they're restful. Um, and then go into a live demonstration. So real quick, um, what, what's ICDX? Um, it, so ICDX allows you to collect information from all semantic products, basically, um, and then some, because uh, we can actually accept um, data through uh, the RabbitMQ, so we can, you can actually forward other stuff into there. Uh, and then you can forward it. Now, once we've normalized it inside of our ICDX, we can transform it into one normalized schema. So whether you're using Symantec Cloud uh, Endpoint or DLP or Proxy SG or whatever, the, a host name on the proxy, a host name on an endpoint, a host name on DLP, all gets normalized. And now you can forward it to Splunk or Elasticsearch or Apache Kafka or whatever, um, JSON and so on. So, so developers seem to love this stuff because it cuts down the development time and try, trying to decipher the Symantec Rosetta Stone of Symantec Endpoint Protection and DLP. You don't need the Rosetta Stone anymore. This is the Rosetta Stone. It'll just translate the stuff for you, which is pretty cool. All right. Um, so here's a screenshot. I'm going to show it live later, but here's a screenshot of um, ICDX Collectors tab. Wow, it, it feels really weird looking up like this. Um, there's a sample collectors, uh, as I pointed out earlier. So each collector has its own way of communicating with uh, different products. Um, so we take care of that for you. So instead of a partner or customer trying to integrate with those individually, it just does it. And then forwarders. I mentioned that before. These are these forwarders available in uh, the Integrated Cyber Defense Exchange. And uh, one thing I want to note is if you guys have questions, don't wait to the end. 
um, just go ahead and raise your hand, and I'll, I'll call you out. I hope that's okay, not breaking protocol or anything. So there's two types of ways to call in to ICDX. There's two open APIs. The top one is for searching, so you can actually search the normalized data in ICDX. Um, and the second one is the openc 2 inspired um, API. And they both require keys, So because obviously you don't want anyone just asking for everything, right? Because there's a lot of confidential data going into this thing. So you need an API key for either one. So this is pretty good, because you could actually have a key that you know, gives one application only search capability, read, then another application that can actually execute and take actions. And the actions one um, is a granular down to the openc 2 command, whether it's a delete file, um, blacklist a file, um, contain a device. Those are all permissions that you can assign per um, API key. Um, OK. So yeah, so you basically, the, the point on this slide is that you have to log in. So yes, somebody has to log in with administrative privileges, then set up a key, and then provide it to the developer or whatever um, orchestrator is going to control uh, access this system. But this is the search one, and then this is the actions one. And I'll show it, I'll show it live in just a few minutes. Um, but here's, I want to highlight the, uh, I forgot I had my clicker. I'm walking over there for no reason. Um, so these are the permissions that I was talking about earlier. These are open C2 commands. Um, so you can uh, uh, technically just allow query, which will be kind of worthless. But um, you could have the deny, which is blacklisting a file, or um, remediation, so you can remediate a file, which is pretty cool. Um, OK. Oh, OK, so I can see it over there. Um, so I tried to map out the commands that we support and the targets that we support. Is, uh, quick question. How many folks in here are, are familiar with OpenC2? Can you raise your hand? Oh, wow. OK, that's almost everybody. That's excellent. Um, so that's why you're here. Um, so here's some of the targets, like f file and device, and what you can do to those file and devices, um, and what, what's required um, for those particular targets. So these are the, the, the specifiers. Uh, you, know, you, you need a SHA-256, MD5, or SHA-1 if you want to delete a file. So the command, as I will show in a few minutes, uh, for a denial file would look like that. Action, deny, target, file, hashes, SHA-256. Pretty easy to read, right? So at Symantec adds new targets um, um, and new products, because uh, we could easily add a, a whole new product here. For example, here, um, if we had uh, proxy SG, we could send this one command um, to ICDX, and it would automatically route it to proxy SG and set so that if it saw a file traveling on the network stack, block with that SHA, block it. Um, if it's going into SEP, semantic endpoint protection, endpoint, it would block it too. Kind of abstracting that. Um, for you orchestrator folks out there, then you would send one command that would block it on all semantic products that have adapters. Um, full disclosure, the only adapter available today on the generally available product is um, SEP, semantic endpoint protection 14. Uh, but of course, our goal is to keep adding um, adapters. And I need some water. And I, I added this slide just to illustrate what's happening behind the scenes with those particular commands, just for clarification. Like the contain one is a quarantine, the endpoint, which will just tell the endpoint to um, enforce whatever fo po policies the administrator set up when it's put in quarantine mode. So for example, um, you can have a firewall policy that blocks um, everything except um, specified admin ports. Um, you can have a block USB policy uh, when you're in quarantine mode and so on, so that you could have a scenario where an endpoint um, is contained and the only way you can, the only person that could access it is somebody from IT, help desk, and um, the user can not start plugging in USB sticks to take data or try to upload their own executables to bypass security or, or do something crazy. Go ahead. When I talk about move, oh, remove. No, so, so it's a good question. So when I'm talking about um, removing um, and, and quarantine, is it moving it from to one, another group? No. Um, so our every group in Symantec Endpoint Protection um, has this loca these locations built into it. Um, so you could have a, a quarantine location. So that one group can actually have your normal policies, 
But if you put in quarantine, it just looks a little bit further down and sees the quarantine policies. So that's pre-work the administrators would have to do. Like, what, what, is, um, your, what, what are your quarantine policies for antivirus, firewall, IPS, host integrity, um, application device control, all these things that our technology has, it can flip a switch and make everything just super strict, right? Um, so that's, a, that's what one option. Um, there is no move command today. Uh -oh. um, so I'm, I'm about to go live with the demo, so I'm going to just kind of highlight how the demo is set up. I was afraid that I, won't ha I wouldn't have internet access from in here, um, and uh, I was afraid the videos wouldn't work, because one time my videos didn't work. So, so, I, so I did it. <laughs> So I did it, I put everything in one box. Unfortunately, it meant that I had to pack quite a bit into this laptop. So, um, so my laptop is set up as such. Um, so I have virtual machines running in VirtualBox. Um, one's an ICDX system um, running, off, running off an, a USB drive. Another one is another uh, guest system running on another USB drive with a manager endpoint in one. And then I'm going to have a Postman client that's going to act as the OpenC2 connector. Now here. You can imagine, if you're, if you're an orchestrator or you have an orchestration um, platform, you can just picture yourself here. So, you're, you know, Demisto, Phantom, whatever, um, a curl command, I mean, you, almost anything that can do HTTPS requests can sit right here to make calls to ICDX. Now, these calls are, now have to be OpenC2 commands, right? And then so how this works is that the OpenC2 client, uh, or what in OpenC2 lingo would be the producer, the producer produces a command, um, sends it over to ICDX. Our ICDX system would then go, oh, I see this is an OpenC2 command because you called this, par this particular HTTPS URL, and we, you have a message body that's OpenC2. So let me, let me see what um, you're trying to do. Oh, you're trying to delete a file. So let me translate that into the products that I have adapters for. I have a Symantec Endpoint Protection 14 Manager adapter, so let me translate it into that language. It sends it over to the manager. The manager then puts it kind of in the PO box, right? Because that endpoint could be at Starbucks, network disconnected. So you could say, delete this file. The person at the Starbucks then connects their laptop to the internet, and when it checks into the manager, it checks its PO box and goes, do you have anything for me? Yes, I have this command to delete a file. Bam, the file's deleted, okay? And once it, when, when the endpoint deletes the file, it sends a log entry. It sends a length, and I put the clock there to indicate that there's gonna be a delay here. Um, it's gonna come back with a response that, yes, I found the file you asked me to delete, and here's the results. Now this the, then gets forwarded into here. So now you have a record of the request going in via OpenC2, and then the response coming back to ICDX. Right now, I don't have a way um, to query for the response with OpenC2. Um, we have to wait for that command to, to exist. But for now, we have our own way to do it with a, a REST call. So as soon as that call is available in OpenC2, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. Any questions so far? Is it pretty clear? OK. Here's what a deny a file um, command looks like. Uh, if you remember from the earlier slides, deny is uh, add to blacklist. So this is a curl command being sent to the ICDX server with its API key, which I've shortened because it's kind of big uh, for the slide. And, and here's the message body. So you see it uh, begins right here, the data payload. Uh, action is deny, target is file. Um, what about a file? A hash. What type of hash? A SHA-256. Um, what's the specific SHA-256? This value. And so sending, executing this command uh, if the server exists, of course, um, you would have to rename that, then it would initiate a blacklist. Here's a contain and endpoint command, and basically everything up top is the same except for the contain and device ID, device and device ID, and the type and the device ID value. Again, this will quarantine this particular computer, which is the one that we're going to be quarantining today. All right, let's go to a live demo. All right, so now we're going to go into the uh, demonstration. These, this is the Postman collection of OpenC2 inspired actions. And very quickly, let's take a look at the 
endpoint environment. So I, I have the semantic endpoint protection client interface up so that we can see when the system gets quarantined, this logo will turn um, red. And when we delete a, uh, sorry, deny a file, um, this won't work. I won't, I won't be able to execute. And then when we remediate a file, this file will disappear. So these are kind of evidence that the actions actually took place. So let's go back to Postman. And in Postman, uh, I mentioned that the query command gives you the features that are uh, available on the ICDX system. And so uh, we target the ICDX system, which is running in a virtual machine local. I'm going to go ahead. This is the openc2 command. And then I'll go ahead and hit send to query ICDX. Um, as you can see here, it's going to port 443 at this par particular path, asking for versions, profiles, and pairs. As you can see here, the version uh, of openc2 that we're work developing towards was the uh, draft 1.0 one, uh, 1 draft uh, February timeframe. And here's those values that you saw earlier, the allow file, allow device, contain device, and so on. So this would be something that could easily be obtained, um, could easily be used uh, by a developer to integrate into their other systems. And under this tool, this, this, this tool that's available online, um, and uh, quite a bit of the features are available for free, uh, can be easily used to extract uh, Python or many other uh, sample codes. Uh, for example, in Node.js, here's a Node.js query um, for features. The developers love this, right? They could just take it out and use it in their product. Okay, so let's next go to uh, deny. Let's deny a file, which if you, rec if you recall, that's when it uh, blacklists the file. So if you take a look at the body, um, you can see that we're targeting a SHA-256. We're doing an action deny. We send it over to the ICDX system by clicking next, I'm sorry, send. And then we get an open C2 like response. There it is. And right now the set manager is receiving the command and populating it to the appropriate um, blacklist policy, which has to be retrieved by endpoints. So if we switch over to the uh, endpoint, this endpoint has to check in before that rats tool becomes uh, blacklisted. Once it checks in, um, the, when I double click on rats, it will no longer execute, but it's still gonna execute, but it hasn't, so it hasn't received the policy. So we'll do a click and, and prepare. So what's happening now is that this file uh, has to wait to be blacklisted by the manager. The manager will take that deny command and to extract the SHA-256 and add it to the blacklist. That blacklist is then uh, tied to uh, the set group that will that it will then be applied to. So this machine is part of that um, global servers group, and that exception, that blacklist policy, um, will be assigned. But it has to be downloaded by the endpoint, and so we have to wait for the endpoint to check in download its policy with the updated list of blacklisted files, and then it will no longer be able to execute this file. So let's see, has it, has it retrieved it yet? Yep. All right, so the blacklist file um, was applied, and now this file can no longer be executed. Okay, so the next step would be to uh, delete the file. Let's demonstrate that. So we're gonna remediate that file. This is what that one looks like, remediate file or the hash SHA-256 of that. We're gonna go send it. We get a successfully applied remediation. We'll flip over to uh, the monitor. And I'm gonna force it to check in again to speed things up. And what's happening now, it's, it's not downloading um, a policy, it's downloading a command to scan. So this computer, uh, is, this SEP client is now scanning the computer looking for that SHA-256. And when it finds it, this uh, file will disappear. So we'll end up with just this one zip file as soon as it completes its scan.
Okay, so that scan took a minute and about 35 seconds, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and delete those, that minute and a half of just waiting uh, from the video. So you, sh you should have just seen it move from uh, update to delete, but keep in mind that a minute and a half passed. Okay, so what do we do next? Let's go ahead and contain this endpoint. Go over to contain. Okay, action contain, the contain what, a device, pass it the device identifier for that particular machine called server2. Um, this is just a variable used in Postman where I can assign the machine identifiers in the environment variables. I'm going to hit, hit send, successfully apply contain command. Let's move back over to the endpoint and we should see this green dot turn red any minute. Let's see this. We'll try it real time. Should be fairly quick. If it takes more than uh, 20 seconds, I'll slice out the 30 to the 20 seconds. I'm gonna go ahead and force it to check in now instead of waiting. Okay, there we go. You can already see the telltale that it is about to quarantine. And there we have it. And give it a second. And it refreshes the interface. There we go. Your computer has been placed on a quarantine network by your administrator. So that took about 45 seconds, if I, could est if I estimate it correctly. So let's go ahead and allow the machine, put it back into normal operation. So we'll go to allow. There's the open C2 allow command for that particular device. Send it over and we'll flip over here and let's just go ahead and tell it to check in so we can hurry up. Okay. And it should be get checking in, retrieving its new update and it sees that it has to be removed from quarantine and there we go. So yes, in demos, um, you know, 10, 30 seconds, 10 to 30 seconds seems like an eternity, but uh, considering what you're doing here, uh, that was amazing. So you've, we've shown how to blacklist a file, how to delete a file, how to contain an uh, endpoint, and how to remove the endpoint from containment. This was, um, I'm, I'm pretty proud of this, it was two years of uh, work, not, not programming work, but just the developing this over the years. I'm a believer in OpenC2, and I got some Antec to believe in it too. So we are now working sticks. I don't know if Brett's in here, but he, he's a Symantec guy, and he's working the sticks taxi end. Um, I'm working myself, and two other guys are on the OpenC2 committee. So we're like really um, transforming into be more f standards focused, which is great. Since we're all huddled so close and we feel like family now, what do you guys think? I mean, is it, is it, all right. Would you, how many of you, no, thanks, thank you.